Good morning. Welcome to this uh, What's Up with the Markets uh, session we're going to do. We're going to analyze the major indices in the United States and in Australia. Uh, but before we do that, I have to tell you that everything we cover here today is of a general investment advice nature. So there's nothing specific here. We don't have your, uh, we don't know what your specific investing objectives are. So this is all just a generic uh, investment advice, if you like, general investment advice. Okay, what I'm going to do, it's uh, going to be a relatively quick session. I'm going to swap over into our technical analysis software. And uh, we are going to uh, just go through the major indices uh, in, uh, in the United States and in Australia. Right, the first uh, chart that we usually look at is, um, is the Dow Jones Index. And uh, so what we have here is a relatively short-term view of the Dow Jones going back to the 2020 uh, uh, COVID-19 crash. You can see on the left-hand side of the chart over here and uh, then the run-up out of it. But we want to concern ourselves with what's happening on the right-hand side of the chart. Now, what we have here is, is resistance, very strong resistance. You can see the number of times the Dow Jones has attempted to rise above this resistance uh, in this right-hand section over here. And uh, what I've drawn here is an upward trending trend line, the red one, which is parallel to this channel over here on the left. But we also have a downtrending channel here, the black channel, which the Dow Jones has broken out of, but has met this resistance. So we're kind of getting to, you've heard me say this uh, quite, a, quite a lot before, we get into an apex where the price action is getting cornered. And on the right hand side over here, we have an ascending triangle where we've got higher lows and resistance along the top side. So one, two, three, four, five, uh, probably this is the sixth attempt attempt that the Dow Jones is, is coming up for right now after the price action uh, today, uh, being Tuesday, the Tuesday in the United States. And the odds are here with this ascending triangle, the breakout of the down channel, and also what's happening on the other indices, which we'll have a look at in a moment, is that we're going to have a breakout to the upside. Uh, one other thing to mention with the Dow is uh, that it's underperforming the S&P 500. So this chart down the bottom over here, bottom right, is a relative strength chart uh, compared to the S&P 500. So it's underperforming the broader market. The Dow Jones 30 components underperforming the S&P 500 constituents. One other thing we'll just quickly look at is we'll put uh, the uh, the clear the chart to see what Sparse Your Investor is saying over here, pretty close to the breakout line. Uh, the sideways trending. So from a mechanical rules-based perspective, uh, the Dow Jones is not given an entry signal yet. Right, down onto the S&P 500. I'll just clear this chart and we'll quickly look at the this, what SPA3 is saying about this. So from a rules-based perspective, we've had an entry signal which occurred uh, back over here in, uh, what is the date there? Uh, oh, sorry, I just can't get it, on the 26th of April, 25th of April. So uh, so we've been, this is nearly two and a half months, been in this uptrend breakout, uh, and uh, we are in a, an uptrend. So a bit stronger price action than the Dow Jones. I know this looks a bit busy, same time frame. Uh, first thing I'll just mention here is the volatility. This is an HRV uh, measurement, a 21-day average true range volatility measurement and volatility is dropping and it's down at healthy levels down here below, well below two. But we have this uptrend. So again, this trend, the uptrending red channels here, same gradient, parallel lines, breakout of the downward channel, breakout above a resistance zone here, which has now become a support zone. In the middle of this, uh, in this channel that we've got over here, there's the, the lower line support Upper line, this this what used to be the lower line of this major channel over here has now become the upper channel line for this channel we have here. And approaching resistance at this blue resistance level up over here. So this trend is up, no doubting it. And uh, no matter which time frame you're looking at, it is up. Let's just zoom in a bit, a bit more over here. And you can see that some people would say this is formed looking like a double top formation, although we did have a slightly higher high on this peak over here, but we've had a higher low now. That low is confirmed uh, on the, on the three-day swing chart. So the odds are here is we're going to have a breakout above this peak. So this is a market that you want to be in in the United States, no doubt about it. 
Uh, we'll now have a look at some other uh, breadth of market and sentiment indicators. The first one being uh, the cumulative new high, new low. So this looks at 52-week highs compared to 52-week lows. And what we're looking at is just go back a bit in time. What we're looking for is this, is this kind of price action here where the, uh, the new high, new low, breadth of market indicators rising as well as price rising and you can see in the in the 2021 2022 bear market we had yeah that we had these little peaks these little run-ups that we had were not confirmed by breadth of market we had more 52 week lows than highs so breadth of market showing weakness that's divergence whereas now we are starting to see the uh the, the 52 week new high new low uh breadth of market indicator starting to flatten out but not rising yet what we'd like to see is this rising a bit but we do have you know higher highs over here we want to see higher highs down here so breadth of market using that breadth of market indicator is not convincing at this stage but this one is a bit more convincing this is the accumulative um accumulative advanced decline line on the new york stock exchange the two the 200 top 250 stocks by market cap again what we're looking here coming out of COVID, we saw rising uh advanced decline line rising uh price action on the on the index and then we saw this divergence happen here during the weakness where we had falling advanced decline line and rising and 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 these peaks from peak to peak and we had uh the we didn't have a corresponding rise in the in the in the cumulative advanced decline line but what we're seeing here on the right hand side is to zoom in a bit is uh from september last year rising price action rising advanced decline line a little bit of flattening and rising advanced decline line. So breadth of market here is looking a bit more positive than the new high, new low. Uh, and of course, you know, these indicators should not be used on their own. They're just really subjective ways, uh, uh, which you should, if you're using subjective ways of analyzing the market, combine all these to form a view, which is not what we do here at Sharewell Systems, as you know, and we'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. Another breadth of market indicator is the number of stocks in the s p 500 that are above their moving their 50-day moving average and you can see this is getting up to 78 percent now this can be used as a contrarian indicator so we had extreme weakness down here uh back in uh in, in june of 2022 and again in september of 2022 uh you know would have been brave to take positions based just on this indicator we do want to see price action. At the end of the day, price action is king. That's that's what we want to follow is the price action. But these do add confidence and weight to depending on how you, how, how you approach the market. Of course, we don't use these indicators. And we'll talk a little bit more about that towards the end of this, this, this short session. But, the, um, but what we do want to see is this is an indication of confidence and breadth of market where we've got uh, what 78 percent of 500 stocks that are above their 50-day moving average so in the short term that's telling us that breadth of market is relatively good and and so is the sentiment and this is a bit longer this is a 150-day simple moving average again contrarian views over here and we do have what is that 66 percent of the s p 500 above their 150-day moving average so that's a little bit of a more medium to longer term than the 50-day and again a bit of a confidence uh, breadth of market indicator so those are looking okay another indicator that i've started using is uh this looks a bit busy i know is the ratio between uh the consumer discretionary sector the spider uh, xly uh, compared to the the staple uh the, the, the staples uh spider which is uh consumer staples so we're comparing discretionary spend versus staple spend and the stocks that make up those particular sectors and so the top chart over here actually shows the consumer discretionary select that's the spider and the middle the, the second chart over here and I, and I don't want to emphasize it too much you can go and look at it in more detail if you want to but this is a ratio it's a relative strength ratio between the consumer discretionary and the consumer staples sectors in, on the s p 500 and uh, but the important chart here is really this next one what i've got here is a smoothed rate of change indicator it's called the siroc indicator and it's relatively long term and when this is falling it's telling us that uh staples are doing better than than discretionary and when this indicator is rising and it's taking a medium to longer term view that the uh that staples are underperforming discretionary i discretionary is out, un, outperforming the consumer uh the consumer stable so what what we're looking for uh to give it for in a bullish context is we want discretionary to be outperforming staples 
over the long term, because typically there are more conservative investors than traders, is is and obviously more funds and a lot weight of money. It, it comes from from the big end of town. Is that Staples does better than consumer discretionary over the long term? Now, if we so I don't want to cut out this too much, but I've gone and lined up. This is a bit of manual back testing, if you like, lined up where the this indicator in this third chart is rising as as to get a, a, a subjective view on when uh, the sentiment is positive. So this is a sentiment indicator. And where we want to go is where the green line over here, you can see the, the green line is, uh, is, is, is where this indicator turned up. So this is an indicator of the relative strength. And the bottom chart over here is the S&P 500. So you can see how the S&P 500 is reacting to this uh, to the sentiment indicator of the ratio between discretionary and staple sectors. So what you want to do is you want to be in you want to be in this uh, in 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 the market. You know when the and I'm just going to pull up another chart over here when the uh, the relative strength. So when consumers are outperforming the S and P 500 as well. So you got consumers outperforming staple and outperforming S and P 500, and that's what uh, that's that's the condition that we have at the moment. We've got an entry signal on consumer, uh, and Staples is falling, and uh, we've got the S and P 500 rising as well. So that is a sentiment indicator. That um, whoops, sorry, into the wrong chart there. That that is a sentiment indicator that is uh, that's adding weight, if you like, to 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 what's uh, to what's going on here. Right, one uh, quick look at the volatility index uh, on the S and P 500. Volatility is falling and has been uh, since the end of 2022. A little bit of a spike there, but down at the bottom bottom end. Let's just zoom out here. Down towards the bottom end of uh, of the uh, of the range. So I've got a, a very subjective eyeball view of what's low and what's high of volatility, and it's down towards this black line at the bottom over here. So so that's typical of a rising bullish market. And and is good to as as an indication, if you like, that this could continue. Of course, it can change very very quickly. So those are the three main indices. The, the two main indices, the two first two of the main indices. The third one is the uh, is is the is the Nasdaq. So there's the Nasdaq uh, starting back in 2020 with the COVID crash. Relative to the COVID crash fall, the Nasdaq has done far better than the other two major indices in the United States and has had a relative pullback compared to the, the big run-up that it had. Now, SPA3 Investor has given an entry signal. This occurred way back in the last week of January, and this is a strong uptrend. So let's just have a look at the um, at a, a bit of trend analysis and support and resistance analysis over here. The member, the Dow, was underperforming the S&P 500 down bottom right here. We can see the relative strength chart is telling us that the, yes, that the NASDAQ is outperforming the S&P 500. So the tech stocks are doing better than, than, than the, 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 the 30 components that make up the Dow Jones. Now, we this channel, the gradient at which that channel coming out of COVID is drawn is the same gradient as here. And the S&P 500 in the shortest term, shorter term, sorry, the, the NASDAQ in the shorter term channel over here is bumping its head on the upper channel line over here. So, uh, and again, also just zooming in a little bit of a double top but a higher high, uh, sorry, a higher low, but the S&P 500, remember, actually made a slightly higher high than NASDAQ did, and so a slightly lower peak than what its previous peak was over here. So similar to the S&P 500, some are saying this could be a, a, a double top and that this down leg hasn't completed yet. Now, everybody sees a double top, not everybody, but most people think of a double top as a change in direction or, or a, a reversal uh, indicated reversal pattern. And uh, if you go and look at PP at, um, at Curtis Arnold's a whole bunch of research he did many, many years ago, he'll tell you that in a rising market that hasn't potentially reached its top yet, a double top can actually be a continuation pattern, which goes against all the Edwards and McGee and technical analysis uh, stuff that's been written about for, uh, over years. So sometimes a double top can be a continuation pattern. Which one it'll be in this instance? Is it a top or a continuation pattern? Time will tell. But the odds are that is that we are going to just looking at the other analysis that that that, that we're looking at is that we're going to have a breakout to the upside on the Nasdaq over here. Uh, other things to point out uh, are that uh, quite a strong resistance zone 
and that we'll probably find a little bit of resistance around about that big round number, 14,000. Uh, but let's see what the market does and when it gets there. Right, some breadth of market indicators on the NASDAQ. So this is the cumulative new high, new low, 52-week uh, new high, new low on the NASDAQ. And uh, it's the NASDAQ 100, not the, not the, the, the composite index. Uh, it's a little bit of divergence still happening over here. So over the period, we've had higher peaks. So, that, so the, the length of that uh, trend line we've got there, the length over here showing that there are still more stocks in making new lows and then what are making new highs but just a little bit of uh, um, light at the end of the tunnel here with the, the last part of this chart starting to rise but you know we did see that over here as well so better market on the nasdaq not quite as good as what it is on the s p 500 remember s p 500 wasn't hitting the hitting home runs either it was basically going sideways so so this being on the NASDAQ 100, what this is telling us is that there's, there are fewer stocks making new highs than new lows. This is also on the NASDAQ 100, again, a breadth of market. So this is uh, stocks that are above their 50-day moving average, shortage term, pretty high, close to 80%. And on uh, the 150, so there's a higher number of stocks over here that are, that are in the NASDAQ than the S&P 500 that are above their 150-day moving average. So a bit more bullish as we've seen in the price action on, on the NASDAQ. Okay, that's uh, before I get into interest rates and a couple of other charts, because we're getting close to, to, um, to, to question time, is, is just looking at those three charts on balance and looking at the, the other indicators that I've looked at. Uh, on balance, the this is bullish. And it's a market, if you've got money exposed to the United States, that you should have exposure to it. And probably if you're a medium, uh, shorter to medium term investor, uh, you should be 100% invested with that capital that you have allocated to any methodology or, or allocation of capital to that market. Um, and of course, that might not may or may not be all of your capital, but certain, certainly the bit that you have, have focused on that particular strategy, you should have 100% invested. And certainly with Spar3 Investor, that is the case. Uh, and, and so what we're going to look at now is interest rates. And, uh, and and a couple of other charts, and then we'll finish up and go into question time. So this is the 10-year uh, yield on, on the Treasury note. Uh, big, long downward channel here going back to 1993, and uh, we've had a, we had a breakout. Now, obviously, interest rates and inflation is still big on everybody's lips and, uh, and is what is, uh, what is certainly having a short-term effect and was the biggest variable that played into what happened over over the 2022 starting 2021 with the with the, with the equity indices um but that uh that that tune if you like that noise that news is starting to get a bit long in the tooth and we started to see the 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 equity indices build interest rates into uh into its analysis so now the market's becoming forward looking uh, interest rates are now given the reactions to, whilst there will be short-term reactions, both positive and negative to announcements and all that sort of thing, it's, it's, that's the nature of short-term movements in the market, is, is over the longer term, we're starting to see some accumulation in bar people who've, you know, the smart money, if you like, the larger end of the market. And that is why we are seeing the, the, uh, the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ starting to rise. Now, the $64 million question on everybody's lips is, is it going to continue and what role will interest rates play from here? Well, the, we certainly had a breakout of the down, the big, long downward channel, the black, uh, black line channel uh, through the upper channel line, broke out, came down, met resistance and, and got above this, uh, this resistance uh, level over here, which is in the low 3% and has risen above and now has had lower highs. So, there is a breakout that has occurred here on the right hand side, but the and some analysts are saying that that is a breakout to go for 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 rates to go higher, certainly bond rates to go higher, the, the market free market bond rates as opposed to the one set by the Fed. But this is also a descending triangle. So what we've got here is support, and we have a uh, we have lower highs. Um, now it just depends where you start this support line because. And, and technical analysis is certainly not a, a science. Uh, what are we going to do? Draw a parallel. And I'll do this live. Is that you may put a trend line there as well. Okay. So if we're looking at the descending triangle, 
uh, which is the blue zone over here with the top upper line over there, then that is a bearish sign because because uh, descending uh, is typically a bearish pattern. What you're looking for is a breakout to the downside here eventually when it gets down there and that most breakouts to the upside of a descending triangle fail. But if this is a is a declining wedge, a falling wedge, then that is a continuation pattern or a bullish pattern, in which case the uh, you would you would see a breakout to the upside being confirmed. Which one is going to be uh, will only be confirmed by the price action that goes on from here. So, what role interest play interest rates play in in the, in the coming weeks and months? A big, there's no doubt. It's in fact before inflation came and and, and everybody was reacting to to interest rates. Um, they were also reacting to interest rates without people really knowing. You know, from from 2010 all the way through to to when inflation started. So over 10 years, people were, were reacting to interest rates and what. Were they reacting to? Well, they were bullish about it because interest rates were extremely low and that was putting people into the market and going into risky assets. So interest rates have never have never stopped playing a role in the market. It's just that now the the mainstream news, mainstream news media has now put more focus on it. So that's going to be an interesting one to watch to see what happens there and which pattern actually plays out and holds the upper hand. Right, on to the all ordinaries. Uh, I'll just clear the chart and we'll get back to the analysis in a moment. Yeah, pretty, so going back, same time frame as what we looked at to the US indices. There's the COVID and you, uh, the COVID crash. You can see relative to the COVID crash, the all lords has not made much headway. Uh, just think of the chart I showed you of the NASDAQ composite of how much further the price action, the peaks, the price action got above the COVID crash and, and how much smaller the COVID crash was relative to the price action that ensued after that. So a bit has been messy here in Australia since uh, since August of 2021. So uh, we are a month shy of this being a really messy market for the best part of two years. So lots of indecision uh, and lots of resistance coming into play and uh, really uh, no, no trend here at all. So let's have a look at uh, some support and resistance. Uh, you can see that the all lords is under, <clears throat> underperforming the S&P 500. It has gone through patches where it has outperformed, but still hasn't had that breakout to the upside. Uh, certainly price action here recently, much weaker than the, uh, the, than the, than the S&P 500. So let's just see what Sparsary Investor's got to say about this. Well, at the moment, Sparsary Investor, you know, being a trend following system, it's been a bit whipsawy through here, a couple of little profit, small profit trades, a couple of little small loss trades, but being but going sideways. Uh, that said, you know, the portfolio, Sparsary Investor portfolios have made some headway uh, since, the, since, the, uh, since the end of last year. Now, this is a sell, so it's a closed market, if you like, on the S&P, oh, sorry, on, on the All Lords. So for shorter to medium term traders, you know, you'd have to put that into your subjective analysis and decide what you're going to do. Sparsary Investor, we remain trading all the time, taking signals as they come. Right. Uh, the last I want to look at is the uh, is the AU is the A dollar versus the US dollar in a downtrend, most definitely in a downtrend. Now, uh, the only thing I want to say about this is that this typically is the world view of the share price of Australia. So the share price of Australia hasn't been that good since February 2021. Um, and uh, the, the Australian dollar is, is, uh, is a strong support over here, around about the low 60s, uh, but is, is certainly in a downtrend at the moment. So I'll go back to the comp just to summarize. Uh, and just repeat my summary of what uh, the analysis is, and then we'll get into, into questions. Uh, and certainly you can start firing those questions in now if you want. Uh, but the uh, the analysis is that we're in uptrends in the US market, Australian market going sideways to nowhere at this stage, looking for, uh, looking for breakouts, uh, or certainly to get above the first resistance zone. And the S&P 500 and the uh, uh, and the, the the Nasdaq in the short term are approaching resistance, a relatively strong resistance zone, uh, and the short term price action is, could be a, a double top. But uh, and whether that double double top is going to be resistance or continuation, it's, and it's happening around about that support that that resistance zone over here. So we're going to we're going to see how this market plays out. A breakout 
into the resistance zone and above it and out of these channels that you've seen on the two charts, the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ will be obviously very bullish. So you can track that yourself. Of course, our customers, uh, I've met this, this analysis will be available for you to pull down into your own instance of Beyond Charts and you will be able to change these analyses and do what you like with them. Uh, the, other, the other one to keep an eye on is the Dow Jones. The Dow Jones is, um, is at resistance as well and it's it's been weaker than the s p 500 and the, and the and the and the nasdaq but all three indices are at that resistance zone so it's going to be key to see and and, and it's going to be quite and uh, it's going to be quite uh, quite quite enjoyable watching to see what happens over the next two or three weeks because it's going to resolve it, itself in the next two or three weeks okay um pleasure Dietmar, uh and uh, we'll talk some more about why we're doing this in a moment Right, uh, just to one thing, just to put to make absolutely clear, as some of our longer term customers have said, is, is that this is general uh, technical analysis. This is subjective technical analysis that we are dealing with here. And it is not the way that, that we trade and invest, actively invest in our, with our medium to longer term, uh, or even for that matter, our, our shorter term trading system. The uh, we are mechanical and rules based with those, and we are 100% invested in uh, in certainly in the in the US portfolios, but the Australian portfolios we're not 100% invested according to the rules of those mechanical systems. So I just want to want to make that absolutely clear. Okay, question: any any views regarding the Chinese market given it's important to the ASX? Okay, we we seen it's there. I have done the preparation for that. We might as well have a look at it. Okay, so this is the um, the, the FTSE China 50. So this is the large large cap uh, end of the market for the Chinese market. <coughs> Massive, big, wide ranging sideways movement here. Let's just zoom in a bit. Underperforming the S and P 500 in a short in a in a downtrend. So we did have this downtrend over here that went from February 2021 and bottomed out down here in uh, in in, uh, in November of last year, 2022, had this rise up, break out of the channel, back into a downtrend. So it's it's not looking good at all on, on the large cap Chinese stocks. And if we go up to the Shanghai or Shea Index, uh, it's a little bit different. Certainly, I could do a wide ranging, massive sideways you know, 25, 30 year sideways moving market there, but volatile in instances. Uh, as this market has matured, you can see this is in a, sorry, let's just go back and get the beginning of that. From 2008, uh, it is in a, in a wide ranging upward. This is the broader Chinese market and has these more volatile runs every now and then, but certainly in a short term downtrend at the moment. Okay, so that's it on Chinese stocks. And of course, FXI is the is the Chinese ETF. Okay, thanks, Rob. Uh, okay, Sparse Investor ASX very quiet for ATR breakouts. Comment, please. Uh, well, um, the uh, certainly good uh, good indicate good um, notif not noticing that Bruce is well. It's it's reacting to the market. So so we've uh, there haven't been breakouts, and we're not trading. Uh, uh, BAPs anymore below action price signals. So we are waiting for entry signals and the and the XAO is uh, or the XJO, you could do the analysis on, on both, is is this the sideways moving market where effectively we made a the the, the peak that we reached uh, was was June 2021, had a couple of bashes, but you know we've had lower highs, little spurts every now and then, but in this wide ranging sideways market. It's uh, it's going to be uh, pockets of of of, uh, you know, of of positive price action is going to happen every now and then with individual stocks and and this is a tough market to trade in Australia no doubt about it tough we've made some headway I think we put some fifteen odd percent in uh, fifteen percent up in over the last six to seven eight months but uh, but what it's doing is it's keeping some of our cash out of the market we'd like to be one hundred percent invested but if the signals aren't there it's indicative of what's happening in the market so. So it's as 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 a mechanical rules based system should do. You know, you should listen. It's listening to the market. It's just reading the price action, and uh, and that's uh, that's that's why that, that's what's happening. Uh, Therese is saying, why does ASX investor use stock filter, but US does not? It's just to reduce drawdown. Well, it's just going by the numbers. Therese, just the research is uh, is that's what it showed us. You know, it's uh, one of the most difficult things. When you go through a research project, 
is is remaining objective and not uh, and just going by the numbers just letting the numbers tell you what what you should do and and so often more often than not just by going by the numbers that your that your research systems the statistics and the the different metrics we use to determine you know, which system is better than another is is just numbers just reading numbers uh, and what we try and do is uh, is we objectively look at those numbers and and keep our discretion and our subjectivity and our wishes and all that out of it um we'd like it to be the same and 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 uh between both both the us and the asx markets but uh but it's so it just complicates a little bit more by having one filter on another one off for each market but yeah, obviously when it's programmed into the software and it's all done for you then it's uh, it's not that difficult but it's just reading the numbers and being objective about the numbers you know we we had we had meetings here at the office about that and we just kept on going back to the numbers until we were all in agreement and all our biases we had to be pushed to one side and we and we get just those what the numbers are telling us and that's what we've gone with but yeah it's not only to reduce drawdown let's, let's, let's keep that it's certainly one of the factors but when you do research you have to have an objective way of measuring what you're trying to achieve and there are um and you'll see it in in in, in our portfolio manager now which is obviously a portfolio manager that's 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 aimed at specifically you know managing rules-based portfolios is those statistics are only meaningful if you have a mechanical rules-based system if you if you don't have one if you're trading subjectively uh and just taking various inputs for your for when to buy and when to sell then those statistics mean nothing because you, you can't measure lots of different moving parts but uh but when you look at the the uh the, the statistics that we put in the expectancy has been in there for quite a while uh the the payoff ratio has been in there for a while the yeah the the win rate all that sort of thing but a key one also is the risk reward ratio which uh which we covered in some detail in last uh, last november when we did our rounds around the country and and in our in our face-to-face -face connect and grow sessions so so and drawdown comes into all of those all of those uh you know risk to reward ratio drawdown is, is quite a major component of calculating the the outcome of that so there are a number of things that go into it uh, but you know you can't if you if you if you focus only on trying to make drawdown as lit, as 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 shallow as possible as small a number as possible then you're going to pay for that in in returns so it's a balance all the time where we try to get returns that are that are four to five percent better than the index the annualized returns over the long of the rolling five-year periods and if you don't if you don't give your portfolio enough room and you don't give your trades enough room to move for a medium to longer term system then then your 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 returns are going to suffer or your time is going to suffer so it's this balance all the time between trying to keep this to you know, somewhere between 15 minutes and and half an hour you know for those that are learning up to an hour a week so time time to effort uh sorry effort to, to return ratio and also also risk to reward ratio as well how much risk you're prepared to take for the reward you're going to get so that balance is ongoing all the time and we think we're there we are it's, and it and we keep on doing research and that's the balance that's the objective that we have with uh with trying to to get that balance for the, the indicators and the way that we manage things so hopefully that answers uh your question uh Therese Dietmar again the ASX needs resource stocks and or financials to outperform in order to make better progress that that's it's a key when you say uh ASX there Dietmar I think you I think you're meaning the major indices because so they are such big weights in in the index and of course you know now we've had now we've got stocks that are, that are more uh, top towards the the top end of the ASX 100 and even into into some of the into some of the mid there are a couple of mid cap stocks there um so you know th those can be out of kilter with, with the rest of the market so uh with, well, with, so when I say the rest of the market sorry the bigger end of town the big market cap stocks which have such a big effect on on what actually happens to the index so 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 that and that is one of the reasons why we introduced some of the stocks that we have now you know they're, they're pushing the boundaries on liquidity um but so so when we look at these stocks we need you know lots we need at least 10 years of data and we also need sufficient liquidity for for the signals to be meaningful and also to support you know many people uh taking fairly sizable positions into those so so it's a um it's a good uh um good comment there Dietmar do you look at the XMJ and the okay uh... What happened there? 
Uh, what's happened to my software? Not doing an update, is it? There we are. Okay. Uh, XMJ. There we are. Must have been doing an update. So Dipmore wants to look at the materials uh, uh, s sector on the on the um, on the on the ASX big sideways movement. So there's COVID. So that's putting into context with some of the other charts we looked at earlier. And only just so so when I use a black dotted or a black uh, rectangle like this, that is the all time high. And I typically leave it as dotted until the price action has broken out above that resistance zone, that all time high resistance zone and remains above it, which it hasn't quite done here yet. So so that is why that is there. So yeah, you, you just look at that chart compared to the, the US charts we looked at. And, uh, and you can see that you know, this is not making much headway. So uh, certainly a big run up over there, but resistance here now for probably as long as it's um, July, 2021. When did the ASX make its its peak in uh, in June of 2021? So playing a big role, obviously the, you know, the, the Rios and the BHPs and the FMGs and, that, and those sorts of stocks are in here. And let's have a look at uh, the financial, this type of way, and we get it. And again, similar. So here's the financial. There's COVID uh, crash over there, and uh, and th this this is this chart over here at the bottom is uh, the um, compared to the all ordinaries index. So you can see underperforming the all ordinaries index is the financial sector. So that's the banks, and that is why. Um, that's that's as Dietmar said. The main reason why the all ordinaries is. Is not making much headway. So our challenge is to have a, is to have a, a, a universe of stocks, if you like, that, that we can look at that can actually make some headway. Um, and that's it's tough. It's always tough to do that because when the whole market's not running, it's difficult to to make headway. But you know, it'll come. It'll definitely come at some stage. We just don't know when. Okay, we'll end it there. Thank you very much for your attendance, and uh, we'll have this up uh, pretty pretty soon.